Welcome to class 36 of uh, topics in power electronics and distributed generation. So, we have looked so far at uh, an example of an L filter for a single phase inverter and based on the RMS uh, current uh, calculations, we saw that uh, the ripple that gets injected into the grid would not meet the standard recommendations. And uh, we can get a similar result based on a, a similar conclusions based on a more exact uh, Fourier analysis. So, what we what is shown here is the Fourier spectrum of a three phase uh, two level voltage source inverter. Uh, its output voltage is 240 volts uh, RMS, uh, which is taken as the base quantity and uh, switching at uh, a frequency 10 kilohertz with a DC bus voltage of 800 volts uh, with sine triangle modulation. So, the modulation index is 0.85. So, if you do the Fourier analysis, your fundamental is uh, having a magnitude of 1 per unit. Uh, if you look at uh, 10 kilohertz, that would correspond to the 200th harmonic and the amplitude at the, the RMS value of uh, the amplitude at uh, the 200th harmonic is around 0.9. So, if you then look at what the specifications uh, uh, recommendations of the standards would be, uh, you would like the to have the uh, per unit in uh, value of your filter inductor to be equal to V per unit divided by I per unit that is allowable at the 200th harmonic. One thing to notice uh, in the standards recommend uh, E 1 harmonic to be uh, uh, 25 percent of the odd harmonic. So, your uh, standards say 0 0.003. So, 25 percent of that is essentially what is recommended and the excitation at the 200 harmonic would correspond to 0.9 amps. So, the required value of uh, the of your uh, inductance would be 6, 6 per unit. So, clearly showing that uh, you would exceed uh, what would be realistic for a practical power converter. Uh, uh, one thing to keep in mind is, uh, so you, you can see that the given harmonics is uh, restricted to 25 percent of the odd harmonics. Uh, this becomes especially important if your switching frequency is low. Uh, of the order of 1 kilohertz, which might be uh, more common at a very high power levels. So, it might actually make sense to actually shift your harmonics for example, instead of 10 kilohertz if it was uh, 9750 uh, uh, kilohertz, uh, then that would correspond to the 195th uh, harmonic. So, you could then uh, 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 eliminate the factor of 0.25 in the denominator over there. So, uh, based on this, we can see that uh, uh, having just an inductive filter uh, may not be possible to meet the standard uh, requirements. So, one could consider a higher order uh, filter such as an LCL filter. So, what is shown in this uh, schematic over here is uh, for a voltage source inverter being connected to the grid through a LCL filter. So, you have L1 connected to the inverter side. L2 connected to the grid side and capacitor C and you can have this as a three phase three wire configuration in which case uh, these dotted lines would not be present or you can have it as a three phase four wire configuration with capacitor center tap in which case the dotted lines would be connected with physical wires. So, one question that can be asked is uh, uh, why did you go from a L filter to a LCL, which is a third order filter? Why not just a LC filter? So, we could consider uh, what uh, would happen if you uh, use a LC filter. So, suppose you have a, the inverter, which can be represented as a, a pulsed voltage source VI. And if you consider the L filter, and then you have the grid voltage V g. So, the first question is where to place the C? You could not de definitely place the C on the inverter side because you have 
to switch from a voltage source to a current source, so you cannot have the capacitor here. So, you could think about possibly connecting the capacitor here and you know that the impedance, uh, uh, if you consider the voltage source ideal, you know that the dynamic impedance of a voltage source would be 0, whereas uh, the dynamic impedance of the capacitor would be 1 by SC. So, whatever ripple would come in the inductor would actually flow through into the grid. Uh, so, this is for an ideal uh, grid. Uh, the, so, you can see that uh, there is no benefit of uh, adding a capacitor. Uh, in a practical grid, you would not just have uh, a solid connection, uh, ideal uh, zero impedance voltage source, you would have some stray inductance, uh, it could be of the lines, the transformers etcetera uh, going back to the grid, in which case this reduces to a LCL filter. So, uh, this is actually an LCL filter. So, practically you would end up with a LCL filter if, even if you just connect the C, uh, but having in the LCL filter where one of the dominant uh, impedances be is governed by a stray parameter is not a great idea because the resonances of this particular filter would vary over a wide range depending on what the value of your stray inductance is. So, it would be it would not be possible to accurately predict where the resonant frequencies lie in such a situation. So, a more practical uh, situation would be to physically add a second inductor and then whatever non ideal inductance is there on the grid would be essentially considered part of your uh, uh, inductance L2. So, your L2 can be designed in such a manner that it dominates over the stray inductance. So, whatever variation exists because of the stray inductance in the grid can be accommodated in a, a, a narrower tolerance range by appropriately designing the LCL filter. So, you can see that uh, uh, there would be a large uncertainty. without L2. And the implication of this is that you would have lar large variations <coughs> large variations in the resonant frequency. So, if you look at uh, the circuit that we uh, are seeing for the LCL filter. So, this would ac accommodate for the configuration for both a 3 phase 3 wire and a 3 phase 4 wire. What one would typically see is that uh, the ripple that is going out into the grid, essentially your grid current ripple is higher in a 3 phase uh, 4 wire uh, converter compared to a 3 phase 3 wire converter because you have now additional paths in the 4 wire case for the 0 sequence components to flow. So, if you have a filter design that meets the standards for the 3 phase 4 wire case, it would typically meet the requirements for the 3 phase uh, 3 wire situation also. So, we will consider the 3 phase uh, 4 wire uh, uh, power con uh, filter to be uh, a, a typical uh, filter uh, which we would then look at in detail. So, if you look at the LCL filter now for the 3 phase 4 wire uh, uh, power converter, we can then look at it on a, a per phase uh, equivalent circuit basis. So, uh, on one side is essentially the inverter voltage V i between the uh, output of your uh, phase leg and the midpoint of the DC bus followed by the LCL filter. On the grid side, you essentially have the, the grid voltage V g, uh, which at frequencies other than the fundamental can be considered a short circuit. And whatever stray inductance impedances are there in the grid can be accommodated along with L 2. So, the grid side can be considered a short circuit for looking at uh, 
frequency is other than the fundamental frequency. So, with this uh, simplified uh, uh, si single phase uh, equivalent circuit, one could go about analyzing the LCL filter. You can then take a look at uh, a typical magnitude uh, response plot of uh, the grid current uh, injection uh, divided by the inverter uh, vo side voltage. So, essentially you are looking at the transfer function Ig of s divided by Vi of s and uh, you are looking at the Bode plot. And if you look at the low frequencies below your resonant frequency. Uh, your uh, attenuation uh, is uh, corresponds to uh, minus 20 dB per decade. So, this would be similar to the attenuation characteristics of a simple inductive filter. Uh, beyond the, the uh, resonant frequency, the attenuation of the LCL filter would correspond to uh, minus 60 dB per decade. Uh, which would correspond to a third order uh, LCL filter. So, if you take a, what is shown over here is the, the, uh, the, the frequency in radians per second and the magnitude uh, of uh, Ig by Vi transfer function which is essentially an admittance transfer function. If you had essentially a L filter, it would continue all along to the higher frequencies at the same uh, minus 20 dB per decade. So, if you are considering say a frequency such as uh, uh, say 10 kilohertz. So, this would correspond to uh, around 6, uh, six uh, into 10 to the power of uh, 4 radians per second. So, you are looking at essentially this point on the LCL filter and this point on the L filter. You have a uh, attenuation difference of about uh, 40 dB. So, you get a improvement in attenuation by a factor of uh, 100 for the LCL filter compared to L filter. So, you know that uh, you could actually uh, meet, it is feasible to meet the attenuation requirement of uh, 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 suggested by the specifications uh, with, the, uh, with the LCL filter. So, what is shown over here is an, uh, not an ideal LCL filter where the resonant peaks would actually go off to a very large value. This shows a damped LCL filter where uh, the resonant frequency is managed, uh, the gain at the resonant frequency is managed to a lower level. One could then use the, uh, to look at the, the transfer function Ig by Vi of s, uh, we can actually uh, get it from the simple equivalent circuit of the LCL filter. So, from the LCL filter network one can actually calculate what is Ig uh, as a Ig of s divided by Vi of s and uh, that can be done with just uh, looking at the uh, impedance values. So, Ig of s divided by Vi of s is 1 by SL1 plus the series value of uh, SL1 plus the uh, impedance of, uh, of C in parallel with L2. So, essentially you have SL2 by SC by and then uh, whatever current flows through uh, your inverter side splits between these two branches depending on the ratio of the impedances. So, you can write it as 1 by S c divided by so this is equal to 1 by 
So, this can also be written as 1 by S L 1 plus L 2 into 1 plus S square L 1 L 2 C divided by L 1 plus L 2. So, the quantity L 1 plus L 2 can be thought of as L. So, essentially the inductor is split into L 1 plus L 2. If you had a first order filter, then essentially the capacitor connection would not be there. You would have essentially just L 1 plus L 2. Now that you add a capacitor in between, you get the addi additional attenuation provided by this term over here. The, this term over here is uh, essentially the parallel L 1 and L 2 in parallel. So, L p is and your resonant uh, frequency is 1 by uh, root L p times c. So, these relationships can be used then to obtain this transfer function i g of s by v i of s. So, this is the the ideal LCL filter without any damping. So, you have very high gain at the resonant frequency and you have the definition of what the resonant frequency and the L value is. We can actually make use of this to actually determine what would be one of the limits for this particular filter design. So, if you look at essentially this particular expression over here. We, we can write, uh, write this particular term as I, I g at your dominant frequency and your omega dom we saw from our Fourier spectrum is essentially 2 pi uh, switching frequency and this would correspond to 1 by S L min 1 times 1 plus omega dom square by omega resonant. So, so, we know that your I g has a value of uh, 0 0.003 on a per unit basis and your V i uh, can be obtained from your Fourier inverter harmonic spectrum. So, one could then uh, rewrite this particular uh, expression in terms of we know what this quantity is and uh, uh, assuming at this point we know what the resonant frequency is, we could make use of this particular expression and put it in the form of determining L minimum in terms of quantities that are known. Uh, you know what the dominant frequency is, we will uh, discuss on how we could select the resonant frequency. So, you have essentially uh, a minimum limit for what your uh, in your inductive term is. You also have a maximum limit for what L 1 uh, uh, L, L max is, what is the maximum value of L 1 plus L 2 and this is based on the DC bus voltage requirement. So, if you look at essentially a typical power converter that is connected to the grid, if you consider a power converter uh, operating with at 20 percent uh, uh, impedance uh, filter impedance value of L being 20 and operating say at unity power factor I g, then essentially at fundamental frequency your voltage drop is j omega L uh, L times I and I is 1 per unit say V g is 1 per unit. So, you have a, a drop voltage drop of 0.2 per unit assuming L is 0.2. So, then if you look at what would be the inverter voltage V i, this would be actually 1.02 per unit. So, it is not very different from V g if you are operating at unity power factor. If you are operating say uh, the power converter as a statcom, say supplying uh, reactive power, uh, 
then essentially you would have Vg and Ig and the uh, voltage drop would now be uh, having a value of 0.2 and your inverter voltage required would be now 1.2 per unit which would be at the higher, higher on the higher side. Suppose that you are not operating as a, uh, either as a, a statcom or you are, even though you are operating as a, in a unity power factor mode typically for a DG you might consider say some variation in the, op, uh, in, the in the power factor when you are operating this particular uh, power converter say uh, you have the grid voltage Vg and say you have your Ig th that you would ideally, ideally like to inject in unity power factor and say you have a range of Ig going say uh, 30 degree lead to 30 degree lag and then if you look at what would be the uh, say the voltage that would be required at the terminal of the power converter. So, when you are trying to uh, inject leading wars you would need a higher terminal voltage when you are trying to inject lagging wars you would require a lo lower terminal voltage. So, you could you could require say about 10 percent more uh, DC bus voltage where when you are operating in say a range of uh, such conditions you might be required to operate in some such a condition under dy dynamic situations when you have phase jumps, frequency shifts etcetera your controls take time to actually react. So, you might need some margin to actually ac accommodate the filter. So, uh, uh, if so keeping in mind what would be a upper limit for your DC bus you would then be able to obtain a range of value of the inductance uh, between say uh, L min and say L max. So, your uh, value of the inductance should lie in this particular range. Uh, we could also think about uh, uh, say in this particular case we are looking at what L is, but what, what we are really interested in is what L1 should be and what L1 L2 should be. So, the question is how should we split uh, the L between L1 and L2. So, one thing that uh, you could then do is look at the expression uh, uh, omega r square is equal to L1 L2 uh, C by L1 plus L2 inverse and then uh, look at uh, L to be equal to L1 plus L2 and define say L1 to be equal to A times uh, A L times L2. So, for example, if uh, A L is close to 0 it means that the entire inductance is uh, L is equal to L2. If uh, A L is equal to 1 it means L1 is equal to L2 and if A L tends to infinity it means the entire inductance is uh, uh, L uh, is in L1 and L2 is negligible. So, you could then write this particular expression for the resonant frequency in terms of L uh, uh, in this particular expression and A L uh, you would then get an expression of the form L is equal to 1 plus A L the whole square divided by omega r into A L C. So, you can then look at this particular expression which uh, is the constraint between the value of uh, L, A L, uh, omega r and c and look at uh, 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 a few minimizations. Okay. So, one thing that you might ask is uh, what is the requirement for uh, for minimum L when A L is equal to 1 uh, keeping omega r and C constant. So, if you take the previous expression and differentiate 
uh, L with respect to L, you could then uh, equate it to 0 either at the minimum or the maximum. Take that second derivative to see whether it is the minimum or the maximum and look at what are the relationship which you could get and you would see that the requirement for minimum L occurs when L is equal to 1 keeping omega R and C constant. Another uh, property that you would observe is that if you have the ripple in Ig is minimum for fixed L and C when A L is equal to 1. So, keeping other parameters like L, C and omega are constant, you can then uh, take the expression for I G and uh, take the derivative with respect to A L and you will see that the ripple in I G is minimum at this particular point of uh, A L. Uh, another point that you could observe is that for, for fixed uh, Ig ripple and uh, L comma C requirement of L, the, so keeping Ig uh, ripple fixed and keeping L fixed, uh, you are allowed to vary A L, but keep L1 plus L2 equal to L as a fixed parameter, you will then see that C requirement is minimum when A L is equal to 1. So, from all these properties, it is actually seen that uh, L1 is equal to L2 is uh, equal to L by 2 is desirable. And uh, uh, in a practical situation, you may not be able to exactly make L1 is equal to L2 because L1 might be a physical inductor that you might add, L2 might be a, the inductance of an interconnection transformer. Uh, you may try to make the, the values close, but you may not be able to make it exactly match, but uh, you know what is the desirable direction. So, you can see that uh, keeping things like uh, uh, you could actually look at the minimum of these functions and uh, keeping things like uh, the value of L to be small is desirable because uh, in a filter if you look at the cost of uh, energy storage, if you look at point number 1 uh, that we, which we just wrote, keeping the L value L uh, minimum uh, given other parameters to be constant would be actually important uh, from a cost perspective the cost per kva of capacitors etcetera is actually much lower than that of uh, inductor. So, it is actually desirable to actually keep your inductive components to be as cost effective as possible. Uh, you also have one more uh, constraint on uh, in the LCL filter. So, if you look at the LCL filter, you while operating the power converter, if you now look at the operation at uh, the fundamental voltage, uh, you have say 240 volts over here and 240 volts RMS over here. The voltage across the capacitor is, would be actually close to 240 volts. So, we are talking of approximate value of the voltage in the filter network. So, there is actually reactive power which is being drawn by the filter capacitor and you do not want that reactive power to be excessive. So, uh, you that would actually form another constraint on the on the filter cap, uh, filter design. So, we, we know that uh, uh, Q of your capacitor is equal to V naught omega naught C and if you uh, keep this to be a limit Q max uh, say 20 percent, uh, 20 percent power uh, uh, Q would correspond to a power factor of 0.96. So, so under uh, operation you do not 
cause a large uh, uh, say offset in your power factor because of the introduction of the, capa uh, the capacitor. So, you have uh, C max and we know the constraint that omega r square is equal to 1 by C max and the corresponding L would correspond to L min and we will we'll call this L min uh, 2 by 4 because uh, we know that L 1 is equal to L 2 is equal to L by 2 is essentially the value uh, and if you then look at uh, L p which is essentially the parallel combination of L 1 by plus L 2 this would be L by 4. So, the corresponding uh, constraint would be L minimum 2 by 4. So, on the minimum side there are two constraints one, one constraint is about the ripple current being injected into the grid. The second constraint is on the amount of cure, uh, reactive power that is being uh, consumed by the filter and you could then say your L min may be the upper limit of your L min 1 and L min 2. So, by selecting this you are ensuring that both the constraints are being met and then your final in inductance uh, would be belong to the range between L min and L max. So, uh, so the uh, another question is uh, what would be uh, uh, how to actually go about uh, uh, the selection of the value of the inductor in this range between your minimum and maximum and the actual choice of the value of L between the minimum and maximum could be based on minimizing the power loss in your filter. Uh, if you look at the power loss in a filter, uh, filter in your value of the uh, power loss at fundamental frequency uh, were plus the value of the power loss at the switching frequency is what you are trying to minimize. And if you look at the trend of power loss at the fundamental frequency, uh, it would actually increase if you have a larger in value of inductance because you need uh, more turns, more length of the wi uh, winding, uh, maybe a larger core. So, you would end up with uh, fundamental loss which tends to increase and so it is desirable to operate closer to L min from the fundamental loss perspective. If you look at the switching loss in the filter inductor, your sw switching ripple current tends to reduce as you increase your inductance. So, the losses also would reduce as your your uh, ripple current through the filter reduces. So, from your switching loss perspective, uh, it is actually desirable to operate close to L max. So, then you look at the overall picture to actually see what point would correspond to the lower uh, loss and we will look, look at this uh, issue in, a, in the subsequent slides to actually determine uh, uh, optimum value of your inductance between the L min and L max range depending on analyzing the loss components within the uh, filter inductor. Uh, so, uh, one item that we uh, still need to uh, figure out is what the resonant fr frequency is and if you look at uh, typical uh, filter designs, you are, uh, you are essentially having uh, a filter where you have a pass band and you have essentially a stop band and you essentially would like your filter to transition from your pass band to your stop band uh, when, when you are actually going between this particular range. So, the question is what belongs to your pass band? Your pass band might have frequencies, you would definitely have the fundamental frequency C in your pass band, you might have say your fifth. Uh, seventh harmonic extra etcetera, your harmonic frequencies in your passband, especially if you are trying to build an active filter which is trying to uh, 
inject and control the harmonics in an accurate manner. You might also say for example, uh, try to reject the harmonics that the grid is uh, uh, putting on your power converter by acti actively ensuring that your bandwidth includes your harmonic frequencies. So, your pass band need not just be your fundamental frequency, it can actually extend further out depending on your bandwidth targets of your power converter. Uh, your stop band would correspond to your switching frequency. and uh, it is uh, side bands and harmonics and you are trying to ensure that all that is in the stop band and then you could actually select your resonant frequency to be a geometric mean between your pass band and stop band. So, with this choice now you have essentially uh, obtained uh, all the components of your LCL filter you know your resonant frequency, you know the choice of L, you know L1, L2 and uh, once you know your omega r, knowing L1 and L2, you automatically fix your capacitance because it is related through your resonant frequency. So, uh, the, the next thing one could consider is then uh, uh, what does this design procedure address? There are multiple constraints in the filter design. So, uh, you have essentially at this point a uh, preliminary uh, one issue that it addresses is uh, it, it definitely addresses the attenuation requirement. It looks at the reactive power constraint it looks at uh, the DC bus uh, voltage constraints and it looks at your fast band and stop band targets. So, the actual value of uh, now, now that we have your preliminary L1, L2 and C, uh, the next question is uh, what is the actual value of L1, L2 that uh, can be designed and the procedure to design the L1 and L2 is based on the area product uh, calculations that we had discussed uh, previously. And we need to choose uh, L1 and L2 uh, from uh, keeping in mind the power loss in the filter inductor and we have seen that uh, the power loss in the filter inductor uh, uh, consists of the core loss component and the winding loss. Uh, the core loss depends on the type of material that is selected, the flux level, the temperature because the loss parameters would uh, and the, the properties of the material would change with uh, temperature also the frequency of excitation. Uh, the winding loss would again depend on the material conductivity, the material conductivity can again change with temperature, the winding length, the geometry, uh, geometrical parameters, number of layers etcetera and frequency of excitation. So, uh, both these terms the core and winding loss terms can be then evaluated at uh, the fundamental frequency excitation and the switching frequency excitation to look at. Uh, what would be the components on uh, the loss components in L1, L2 and the other parts of the filter and uh, we can ac we will actually do that. So, if you look at uh, the, the filter inductor L1, this is an example of a, a 10 kVA 415 volt uh, inverter uh, switching at 10 kilohertz. Uh, what is shown in uh, these figures are essentially uh, what is plotted is the power loss in the inductor uh, L1. Uh, uh, the first figure over here shows the winding loss as a function of uh, 
uh, L which is L1 plus L2 uh, ranging between say 1% one, uh, 1 to 14 percent and uh, you, you know, the next figure shows the core loss uh, again when L is uh, varied between 1 and 14 percent and uh, you, you are looking at the loss in the core uh, with a variation of L uh, lo loss in the core of L1 when L1 plus L2 is varied. So, you can see that uh, if you compare these two figures uh, this is actually for a ferrite inductor. So, you would expect uh, it to be used at very high frequencies. It is being used at 10 kilohertz. So, the core loss is actually much lower than the winding loss. So, if you look at the winding loss uh, uh, components you are looking at numbers of the order of 20 whereas, if you are looking at the core loss you are looking at numbers uh, the range of this particular plot has a maximum of 4. So, you can see that uh, the winding loss in this particular due to the selection of this particular material the winding loss dominates over the uh, core loss. Uh, potentially if you had used steel laminations rather than ferrites you could get much higher losses in the uh, core rather than in the winding. So, you could then look at then uh, the trends between uh, uh, the, the, the core loss and the winding loss. If you look at the core loss in this particular case you can what is plotted along the two uh, y axis one is the 50 hertz loss. Uh, so, this is the 50 hertz loss is shown in this particular axis you can see that the maximum value of the 50 hertz uh, loss is in the range of 0 0.04 and then you look at the core loss at the switching frequency you have a value of 0.4. So, if it was actually plotted on the same axis the core loss at 50 hertz would be almost a straight line at the very bottom. So, it would not affect the overall uh, lo loss characteristics significantly, but you could see the underlying trend the 50 hertz component of the losses has a increasing trend as you uh, increase the value of L total. And if you look at the switching frequency term at low, freq, uh, low value of L the switching ripple is large. So, you are having higher losses, but as you increase the value of L the switching ripple reduces. So, your losses come down as your uh, L is made uh, goes to a larger value. If you look at then the Uh, if you look at then the, uh, the winding related loss again you have a similar trend. If you look at the 50 hertz loss in, in the winding it has again an increasing trend. Uh, whereas, if you look at the switching ripple re related loss uh, uh, you would end up with a decreasing trend as you are increasing the value of L. And so, the overall trend for the losses would be uh, to select a value which tends to give you the lowest losses which would lie in this between this range. Okay. Uh, you could um, you, you can see that uh, in this particular example uh, the even though the trend is uh, uh, can be seen from the curve the actual value of the loss is having a, uh, a up and down characteristic this is because each of these points corresponds to a different inductor design. So, uh, L being 1 per unit would correspond to one particular inductor L being uh, 0.2 or 0.3 or 0.4 they are different inductors. So, if you go beyond say a value of L you might need to go to the next larger size core or you might need one more layer in your windings. So, uh, the, the these jumps that you see is because of discontinuities because of you are changing your physical inductor from one particular value selection to a next selection which makes this curve have have a non uniform non uniformity in it, but the overall trend can be seen under un, underlying this non uniformities where at the very low values of L your switching related terms would dominate and at the very large values of L it would be your fundamental related terms that would dominate. So, once uh, you so this is for loss in inductor L 1 
you could then do a similar analysis for inductor L2. If you look at uh, the inductor L2, the we know that our uh, your ripple current in the grid that is being specified Ig ripple uh, at the uh, switching frequency is 0 0.003 per unit. So, in terms of the uh, ripple current flowing through inductor L2, there is almost no ripple. So, if you if you look at the high frequency loss in the grid side inductor, it can actually be neglected. You can think of it as essentially a fundamental frequency which is flowing through the inductor L2. So, then if you look at the fundamental frequency loss term in the inductor L2, again you can see the underlying characteristics. Uh, the core loss is in the range between 0 and 0 0.03, the winding loss is in the range between 0 and 20. So, uh, if you look at the overall losses, uh, the winding loss is the dominant term because we have selected a ferrite core inductor. Uh, and uh, the over the losses in the total inductance uh, would be the sum of the losses in L1 plus L2. So, the underlying trend in both these cases is actually increasing losses as you are increasing the value of L. So, one could then look at what would be the total loss in the in the LCL filter. So, this actually includes not just the losses in the L1 and L2, it also includes the losses in uh, damping terms in the circuit. Uh, so, if you look at uh, the loss term overall as a function of L, so what is shown in this uh, green dotted line is the total loss as a function of L1 plus L2, where it is varied in the between the 1 percent to 14 percent range. And uh, it's, uh, we are looking at a uh, three different frequencies. One is at uh, uh, very low uh, switching frequency. So, this corresponds to 8 kilohertz. Uh, so, this would correspond to a low switching frequency and this would correspond to a high switching frequency. So, this is uh, 16 kilohertz and what is in between is for the 10 kilohertz term. So, you could see that when you your loss in the filter design is uh, is having this uh, trade off between uh, the losses at the low value of L and the losses at the high value of L even for the different frequency ranges. But uh, it is also interesting to see the point at which the minimum occurs is for the low value the high value of switching frequency a desirable range of your, uh, your minimum loss is occurring. Uh, around 0.4, uh, uh, around 4 percent value of inductance. Whereas, if you look at the case when you are operating at low switching frequency, the desired value of L, the total inductance L, L1 plus L2 shifts from a low frequency to a higher frequency uh, of uh, higher value of LT to a, about 0.9 uh, percent. So, uh, at 16 kilohertz, you are having a, a minimum loss around 4 percent at around uh, 8 kilohertz switching frequency, the minimum loss point uh, shifts up to a larger value of inductance. So, this is what you nat naturally expect. If your switching frequency is uh, low, you need higher value of inductance in your filter. And if your switching frequency is high, you need a lower value of inductance in your filter. The other thing to observe is that at the low value of switching frequency, the losses in your filter inductor is actually about 50 watts, whereas at the high value of uh, switching frequency, your losses in your filter is uh, lower about uh, uh, slightly lower than 20 watts. So, you could then consider not just the losses in the filter, you could also consider the losses uh, in the filter in the filter plus the semiconductor devices because you know that you get lower losses in the filter, but your losses switching losses in your uh, IGBTs and uh, recovery losses in your diodes is going up with switching frequency. So, you could not just look at it from the filter perspective, you could actually look at a minimization from the overall perspective. So, depending on the frequency you have chosen, you could then consider 
uh, value of uh, L So, uh, you could select a value of L that leads to minimum loss uh, that could be a, pr a, a preferred filter design. There are multiple perspectives. One is you have high efficiency because you are selecting a, a filter which leads to lower losses. You have low temperature rise, low temperature of the filter components which uh, improves the reliability. Uh, so, if you look at it from your net, pers uh, net percent value basis, your cost of lo loss is actually reducing. In your net percent value, and uh, sometimes, uh, if you just go by the rule of thumb, you might have ended up selecting a, a, a larger value of filter inductor. But you know that physically, because you have done the analysis you might actually be able to select a filter which is actually uh, having a lower value than initially thought which actually reduces the initial cost too. So, from multiple perspectives you can actually end up with a be better filter by doing a close analysis of uh, what would be the, uh, the power loss and the therm thermal rise in your uh, filter. So, uh, we, uh, we can also see that So, we uh, some of the points to note are is a function of uh, switching frequency. The second thing is uh, at high f s w lower value of l is preferable. So, we saw that uh, at 16 kilohertz your preferable l was closer to the 4 percent range. And the power loss in the filter reduces as the switching frequency increases. So, your overall uh, uh, switching frequency in your overall design can, uh, because uh, in many designs you often ask what is your switching frequency and you might say 10 kilohertz or 20 kilohertz or some number. So, later on you can actually justify why you selected a particular switching frequency through such a loss, loss calculation which leads to what is the best switching frequency that the power converter can operate. So, you could select your frequency to minimize the sum of the losses in the semiconductor plus filter. So, if you look at the overall characteristics, you can think about uh, 
the total power loss is a function of what your L uh, per unit is and it is also a function of your switching frequency essentially you are looking at what is the point which gives you your best desired uh, loss uh, subject to constraints on your total value of L uh, lying between some minimum and maximum range. So, at this point we have actually now uh, your selection. So, of L 1 comma L 2 comma C and uh, we can actually look at uh, non-idealities of your power converter uh, and a primary non-ideality which uh, you automatically get one if once you go into a higher order filter design is uh, how to deal with filter resonances. So, this is one aspect that we would need to consider, thank you.